Appreciate y'all tuning in. This is the Bible Search Program where we search the Bible. My name is Jacob Thornton. I'm a Christian. I'm a member of the Church of Christ. I live in Orville, California. My information is found on there in the corner. If you want to send me a text or a call or an email and request a Bible study or some free Bible study material, or if you want me to do a video covering a topic of your request, I will do that. Today's requested topic is universalism, which is the idea is everyone going to be saved? And when I say saved, I mean, is everyone going to receive eternal life? So we're going to look at that idea. And there's a lot of individuals out in the world who use Bible verses to promote false teachings, which those verses do not teach. And so we're going to look at this. Simply put, no, universalism is not true. Not everyone, according to the Bible, is going to receive eternal life. And so we only need a few verses to prove that. And we're going to look at all the different verses. I have here 16 different verses which are taken out of context to promote and teach the idea of universalism. The idea that everyone is going to be saved. And this is the thing that if you just compare these verses with these verses, you can actually see universalism is not true. And it's not teaching and promoting the truth. And so... There's a lot of false teachings out in the world, teaching a lot of different things. Like we're going to look at in some of the later videos, a lot of individuals think that you can be saved by faith only. You know, and a lot of people who don't know about the Bible, like, what are you talking about? I've never heard of any, any of these things before. And so that's why we're going over it. So we can learn the truth. So we can come to a knowledge of the truth. We can turn away from those things which are wrong. And we can be saved by putting our faith in the truth. And so the truth has already been revealed. You notice, what are we looking at here? We're looking at Bible verses. We're looking at Bible verses for what? We're looking at Bible verses to examine the truth. This is where the truth is found. And so there's individuals in the world who use the Bible verses of truth to promote false teachings. And one example is there's a verse which says that God desires all men to be saved. And that word for men is used as mankind, that God desires all of mankind to be saved, both men and women. Now, you can take that verse out of context and make it a false teaching by saying, well, the verse actually says God only desires all men to be saved. And therefore, he doesn't really care if women are saved. That is an example of taking a verse out of context. Because it's not saying that God only wants men to be saved. That word there is used for mankind. And God desires all men, men and women, to be saved. And so that's an example of taking verses out of context. We're going to look at these verses taken out of context. And usually when a verse is taken out of context, what they're doing is they're focusing on a certain section of the Bible verse. And they're not reading before it or after it. So that's why as Christians, as individuals who are just studying to come to a knowledge of the truth, you need to read before the verse, a few verses before it, and after the verse, a few verses after it. And so universalism, this is what we're going to be going over in the video. Is everyone going to receive eternal life? Simply put, no. So let's get into it. These verses, which I'm going to review first are going over that no not everyone is going to be saved and then we're going to go over the verses which are used to promote the false teaching of universalism jesus in mark chapter 16 verse 15 and 16 says he said to them go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved but he that believeth not shall be damned and this is the word for condemned so here we read about two groups of individuals those who are saved and those who are saved are those who believe and are baptized. And those who are damned are those who do not believe. And if they don't believe, they're not going to be baptized. And so here we read that some individuals aren't going to be saved. There is a requirement that individuals need to meet in order to obtain salvation. Here that requirement is belief and a baptism. Whoever believes and is baptized shall be saved. So not everyone is going to be saved. Not everyone is going to receive eternal life. Now you have the choice today. Those of you who are hearing this, Jesus died for your sins. He resurrected for your forgiveness. 
He ascended into heaven and sat down on God's throne, ruling and reigning as king of kings, lord of lords. He's ruler of the nations. And he is offering forgiveness through his blood that was shed on the cross. And if you want to be forgiven, you need to believe that gospel message that Jesus died for your sins and rose for your forgiveness. And you need to be baptized in order that your sins might be washed away by the blood of Jesus. So you have opportunity today to be saved. You don't have to fall into the category of the damned, of the condemned. You can be saved. This is another verse where Jesus teaches that at the day of judgment, a lot of individuals are going to have the desire to be saved, but they're not going to be saved. And so this tells us that not everyone is going to receive eternal life. Then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And Jesus said unto them, Strive to enter in at the straight gate, meaning the narrow gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. When once the master of the house is risen up and hath shut to the door, you begin to stand without, meaning outside, and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us, and he shall answer and say unto you, I know not whence ye are. So here's the idea. Here's a picture of Judgment Day. They ask him, are there few that are going to be saved? And Jesus answers, yes. Many are going to seek to enter in. Many are going to desire to receive eternal life and shall not be able. And so what will those individuals be doing then? Here the picture is, is that they're standing at a door, knocking, desiring to come in to receive that eternal life. And the door will never be open for them. It's a picture of no hope, no mercy, no compassion. But you don't have to fall into that category. Those who are listening today, you don't have to fall into that category. You can be saved. You can be among the few who are saved who enter in at the straight gate, at the narrow gate. Jesus said, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. You don't have to fall into the category of those who are not going to receive eternal life. Same thing here. We have two categories of people, the saved and the unsaved. And here there's two different eternal destinies. There's going to be one resurrection. Christ is in heaven right now. Jesus Christ, I mentioned he died. He resurrected from the dead. He ascended into heaven and he promises to come from heaven to raise the dead and take to heaven those who are going to heaven. And so it says, marvel not at this for the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. This is reference to Jesus raising the dead. Every individual is going to hear his voice. You know, you might have a grandfather who died. Jesus is through whom the resurrection will come. Jesus is going to raise your granddad. Jesus is going to raise your father, your mother, those individuals who have died. And there's only two destinations in which we can have. They that have done good, they're going to see the resurrection of life. And they that have done evil, they're going to see the resurrection of damnation. So there's two different categories. There's one resurrection, but there's two groups in the resurrection. Those who are going to receive eternal life and those who are going to be damned. And so if we want to receive the resurrection of eternal life, we need to be seeking to do good. The Bible tells us the good things. It tells us what good works are. We need to be pursuing those things. Otherwise, if we want to do evil, you know, and... and Evil, we might think, oh, you know, murdering someone who's innocent, that might be evil. Stealing from the poor, that might be evil. But the Bible teaches that if it's not from the word of God, for example, Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel were instructed how to worship God. They were instructed to do animal sacrifices. Cain chose not to offer an animal sacrifice, but he brought fruit from the ground as an offering to God. And it said what he did was evil, you know? So just not following the instructions of the Lord is considered evil. It's not good. It's not good to do the wrong thing. That's evil. It's evil to do the wrong thing. And so if we want to do what's good, if we want the resurrection of life, we need to do 
in this life what God has commanded us to do. And so this is shown that not everyone is going to receive eternal life. There's a group of individuals who are going to be damned. You don't have to be part of that group. You can be saved. You can believe the gospel. You can trust in Jesus as the resurrected Savior of the world whose blood was shed for your forgiveness. And when you become baptized, buried with him in his death, risen with him to walk in newness of life, you're a new creature, you're a new creation, you're a child of God. Same thing in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15 and 16, and John chapter 3, verse 14 and 16, we read that there's two groups of people. There are those who are going to receive eternal life, who are saved, and there's those who perish, which is reference to those who are condemned. And so we don't have to be among the condemned. We can be among those who are going to receive eternal life. And God wants us to be among those who are going to receive eternal life. You don't have to reject the gospel. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ, meaning, meaning an aroma, a smell, where a sweet smell of Christ and them that are saved and in them not perish. So to God, when you preach the gospel that Jesus died for the sins of the world, that he resurrected and ascended into heaven, when you preach the gospel teachings, regardless if the individuals accept it or reject it, you are pleasing to God. And it says this, to the one we are the savor of death unto death and to the other the savor of life unto life. When you preach the gospel and those who become saved, you know what happens when those individuals who are hearing the gospel who will become saved? That aroma, that smell that they are smelling, when you share with them the preaching of Christ, it is good to them. It is life to them. And so here, the category of those who perish, those who don't want the gospel, when you share the gospel message with them, you have the smell, the stench of death. And when it says death unto death, that's saying beginning with death, ending with death, meaning everything about it is just a turn off. It is everything about the gospel message to those who are perishing. They want nothing to do with it. It's to them as the stench of death. But to those who hear the gospel and choose to be saved, those who hear the gospel, it is as life to them. It's bringing them life and it leads to eternal life. In John chapter 3, verse 14 and 16, we read about two categories of people. Those who are perishing, those who will perish, those who are receiving eternal life. And so this is referenced to on the day of judgment when we read about the resurrection of the dead. Individuals will be resurrected to damnation, meaning condemnation, or individuals will be resurrected to eternal life. And so we have the choice now whether or not we're going to be among the category of those who are receiving eternal life. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the, the Son of Man must be lifted up. He's talking there about his death on the cross. Jesus died on the cross. He was lifted up that whosoever believeth him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so here we read about two groups of individuals. Those who believe in him, those who believe in in Jesus and do what he says they're going to receive eternal life but those who do not believe Jesus those who don't do what he says they are going to perish and so the idea of perishing it's put in contrast with everlasting life and therefore it's everlasting punishments everlasting death and so um, this is just to show that not everyone is going to receive eternal life. Those who choose to believe in Jesus and do what he said are going to receive eternal life. And so what we see here, this verse says to believe in him to receive eternal life. And if we compare this with Mark 16, 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. So when it says you believe in Jesus, that doesn't mean you simply profess with your mouth, oh yeah, I believe with Jesus, I believe in Jesus, therefore now I'm saved. No, that's not how it goes. You need to believe in Jesus and you need to be baptized into his death if you want to be saved. It's possible. You can do this. There is water near you. You can find some water. You can be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins and have the hope of eternal life.
Here in Matthew chapter 25, we read about on the judgment day. There's two groups of people. Those who are going to be saved. Those who are not going to be saved. Those who are going to receive eternal life. And those who are going to receive eternal punishment. And so the focus of this is on those who aren't going to receive eternal life. Because the question is, is everyone going to receive eternal life? As universalism states, no, not everyone is going to receive eternal life. Here's a picture of the final judgment when Christ comes. The dead are resurrected. Everyone stands before him. You know, there's that single resurrection for those two groups of people, those who are resurrected to damnation and those who are resurrected to life. And it says, when the son of man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he shall sit upon the throne of his glory and before him shall be gathered all nations and he shall separate them one from the other. So here's one judgment scene, but two groups of people. As a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats, and he shall set set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Two categories of people. Sheep on the right, goats on the left. Then the king shall say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Then shall he say unto them on his left hand. So those on the right hand are going to inherit the kingdom. And as seen here, that's reference to receiving eternal life. When you inherit the kingdom, that's reference to receiving eternal life. This is at the day of judgment. This hasn't happened yet. Individuals still have the decision today whether or not they're going to be among this category. If we choose not to obey the gospel, look what it says. We're going to be among this category if we choose to disobey God. Then shall he say unto them also on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels, and these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. And so here is the thing, eternal life, everlasting punishment, those are both eternal, but one group is over here receiving eternal life and another group is over here receiving eternal punishment and everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Is everyone according to this going to receive eternal life? No, only the righteous, but those who are on the left hand who are considered goats, those who did not practice righteousness in this life, those who practice unrighteousness, are not going to receive eternal life. But it says their destination will be an everlasting fire with everlasting punishment. So the question is, is the reason why we bring up this verse, universalism, is everyone going to receive eternal life? No, everyone is not going to receive eternal life. So now we're going to look at the verses which are taken out of context in order to promote this idea of universalism. And so if you ask someone who teaches universalism, someone who believes that the Bible teaches everyone is going to receive eternal life. These are the verses which they're going to go to. But you have to keep in mind, look at everything we just read. We read about there's requirements for salvation. Everyone who believes in is baptized is going to be saved. We just read about the two categories of people, those who are resurrected to damnation, those who are resurrected to life. And so knowing all those, we have to keep that in mind as we're trying to understand what these verses mean. And so here, these are all you see how it's one, two, three, four different verses. And we have a total of 16 verses that they use, but they just pluck these verses out of their context and say, oh, like, for example, let's read the first one. John three seventeen. for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. So they say, look, God sent his son to save the world. He's not going to condemn the world. This verse is taken out of context by them. So we're going to look at these verses and we're going to explain what they mean because they do not teach the idea that everyone is going to be saved. So let's look at this. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. When Jesus was born of a virgin, proclaimed as the son of God, right? Who's his father? It's God. He's the son of God. His mother was Mary. Jesus, when he was born, he came from heaven to be born a baby to become man. So Jesus is both God and man. He has both natures. Just as you know, if, if a dog reproduces, what is that offspring going to be? What nature? Dog. Same thing with a cat. A cat's going to have a cat. Jesus existed in the nature of God before he was born. He was birthed. He's the son of God. Therefore, he has that God nature, that divine nature. Also, his mother was Mary, so he took on a, upon himself human nature. And that first coming of Jesus when he was born into the world, 
the reason that Jesus was born was not to condemn the world. The world is already condemned because of our sin. He did not come to condemn us, but he came to save us. And so just because Jesus came into the world to save the world, and when it says the world, that means the population, that does not mean that every individual is going to be saved. It means that he came into the world to offer the opportunity and the possibility of salvation to everyone who would believe now everyone doesn't believe this verse does not teach that jesus is going to save the whole world this says that if the world wants to be saved you know who they're going to have to go to to receive their salvation jesus It's jesus who's the savior of the world that's what's said also in this next verse the next day john the baptist saw jesus coming toward him and said behold the lamb of god who takes away the sins of the world so universalists take this verse and say look jesus took away the sins of the whole world that's not what this is teaching. This does teach that Jesus died for every man. If you want your sins forgiven, you're going to have to go through Jesus. But this does not teach that just because Jesus died for the sins of everyone, that everyone is going to be forgiven. This means that if you want your sins forgiven, you're going to have to go through Jesus. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 through 6 also tells us, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. It says here, Jesus died for all. He gave himself as a ransom for all. He died for every person's sins, and God would have all men to be saved. Now, this doesn't mean that all men are going to be saved. It says Jesus died for all. The reason why Jesus died for all is because God wants every person to be saved, but not every person is going to be saved. We already looked at that. There's two groups of individuals, those who are going to be resurrected to damnation, those who are going to be resurrected to life. And so what this verse is teaching here is that if you want to be saved, God wants you to be saved. And if you want to be saved, you're going to have to go through Jesus. He is the one who died for your sins. He is the mediator between God and men. If you want to be saved, you're going to have to go through Jesus. John chapter 12, verse 32. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This verse they use to teach that Jesus, because he died for the sins of the world, all men are going to be drawn into him and receive eternal life. Now, that's just not the case with this verse is teaching. This verse is teaching that Jesus died for everyone's sins, and therefore, if anyone wants forgiveness for their sins, they're going to have to go through him. Jesus' blood was shed and has power to redeem the sins of anyone, of everyone who believes in him. And so, this verse is not teaching that Eternal life will be given to every person. None of these verses are. What all these verses teach is that in Jesus' first coming, when he was born of a virgin, his first coming, he died for everyone who sins. That's literally what these verses are talking about. The purpose of Jesus' first coming was to die for your sins. And not only your sins, but the sins of everyone. And that's what we're going to be looking at here. Jesus died for the sins of everyone. Now, there's some individuals in the world who are going to accept that sacrifice, that offering that Jesus made. They're going to believe it and they're going to obey Jesus and his teachings. But just because you accepted the offering for your sins and received your forgiveness doesn't mean you're the only one who's going to be forgiven. Everyone has the opportunity to be forgiven through Jesus. And it says in 1 John 2, 2, he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Jesus did not die only for those who would be forgiven. Jesus died for everyone. He has brought the opportunity for salvation for everyone. This means that as long as your neighbor is still alive, even though he's not a Christian, you know what? Jesus died for his sins, and your neighbor still has opportunity to obey the gospel before he dies, that he might receive eternal life. 1 Timothy 4.10, For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, specifically, meaning specially of those who believe. And so this verse says God is the Savior of all men. And so 
they use this verse, universalists use this verse to say, look, God's the savior of all men. Yeah, he is. If you want to be saved, you're going to have to go through God. He's the savior of all men. You're not going to find another savior except God. But this verse is not teaching that God is going to save all men. It says here, God is the savior of all men, specifically to those who believe. And so individuals who are not believers, they have the opportunity to be saved. And who are they going to have to go to? They're going to have to go to the savior of all men. There's no other savior. John 17, 2, and it says, And thou hast given him power over all flesh. This is reference to Jesus receiving authority over Jew and Gentile, over every single person who's ever lived, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. So they say, look, Jesus was given all flesh, and he's going to give eternal life to as many as were given him. Therefore, he's going to give eternal life to all flesh. That's not what this verse is teaching. This verse is teaching that Jesus has received authority over the righteous and the unrighteous. Jesus has received authority over the good and the evil. Jesus has authority over everybody, good and bad. But only those who are good and righteous will receive that eternal life. This verse does not teach that all flesh is going to receive eternal life. And that we read so many passages about that. There's two groups of individuals. Those who are going to receive damnation and those who are going to receive life. 1 John 4, 14. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. So they say, look, Jesus was sent to be the Savior of the world. Therefore, the whole world saved. That's not what this is saying. This verse is saying that if the world wants to be saved, who is going to be their Savior? Jesus. Jesus is going to be their Savior. You have no other Savior other than the one whom the Father sent to be the Savior of the world. And here's what all these verses are teaching. Jesus died for everyone who sins, but not everyone believes in his atonement in order that they might receive eternal life. This verse teaches that Jesus died for everyone, but not everyone is going to choose to be saved. Everyone has the opportunity to be saved and the chance of salvation, but not everyone is going to accept that. There's two categories. He says, not ours only, there's one category of those who believe the gospel, but also for the sins of the whole world. And that's reference to even unbelievers included. But there's two categories, those who believe and those who are disobedient. And so we have opportunity to be among those who believe. We don't have to remain disobedient in our sins. We can be forgiven and walk in that newness of life, which comes through Jesus. These verses, what they teach is that salvation is for everyone who believes, both the Jew and Gentile. Salvation is not just for one group of people. Salvation is for everyone. So it's your choice whether or not you want to become part of God's chosen, of God's church, which is the church of Christ. If you believe and are baptized, you're added to the church, which Jesus had established. There's one church in the Bible you read about. Romans 16, 16 says the churches of Christ salute you. There's names all over the Bible for the church. And so we're going to be looking now. This salvation is for everyone. Anyone can be a member of the church as long as you're willing to believe in God and his son and obey the teachings. In Romans chapter 5, we read about the, the difference between Adam, you know, Adam and Eve, Adam and Jesus. And so Adam introduced sin into the world, but Jesus introduced righteousness into the world. And that's what this verse is teaching. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of the one, the free gift came upon all men to the justification of life. This verse is not teaching that all men are going to receive the justification of life. This verse is teaching that Adam, through his one sin, God said, don't eat from this tree. Adam and Eve both ate from that tree. Sin was introduced into the world. Before that, there was no sin in the world. Adam introduced sin into the world. Likewise, the righteousness that comes by faith under the New Testament was not in the world. But Jesus introduced it into the world. So since Adam and since sin was introduced into the world, there had been no remedy for sin. Jesus introduced a remedy for sin. And who's this remedy for? It's for all who were condemned. So everyone has an opportunity to obtain the salvation, but that doesn't mean everyone is going to obtain the salvation. Jesus introduced the free gift of the justification of life into the world. 
Romans chapter 11, verse 22, For God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. So this verse, the universalists teach, oh, God looks at everyone and says, everyone has unbelief, therefore I'm going to have mercy on everyone, even in their unbelief. That's not what this verse is teaching. This verse is teaching that everyone is condemned, the Jew and Gentile. Therefore, everyone has the chance of receiving the mercy from God. This salvation, this mercy is not for just a certain group of people, but it says God concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy on all. If you're in unbelief, guess what? You need mercy. How are you going to receive your mercy? By believing. So this verse is not teaching that the mercy of God is going to come upon the unbelieving in their unbelief. This verse is teaching that because everyone is considered unbelieving, everyone is considered condemned by their sin, everyone needs mercy. Luke chapter 3 verse 6 says, all flesh shall see the salvation of God. And so they say, look, all flesh is going to be saved. All flesh is going to see the salvation of God. That's not what this verse is teaching. This verse is teaching that salvation is not just for the Jew. Salvation is also for the Gentile. Salvation is made available for all men. Now, are all men going to be saved? No, we already read that. So this verse, they say, look, it says, all flesh shall see the salvation of God. But we read here. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Here's this group of people who are not going to see salvation. And so when it says all flesh shall see the salvation of God, that's saying every individual has the opportunity to be saved. Look what it says. Preach the gospel to who? To every creature. Why? Because salvation is for all flesh. Salvation is for everyone. Don't leave anyone out. Preach the gospel to every creature. They should be included. They are considered as having unbelief, and therefore they need mercy from God, as we've been looking at. So there's two groups of people, those who are saved and those who are damned. And it says here, all flesh shall see the salvation of God. This means that the salvation of God is offered to all flesh. It doesn't mean everyone's going to be saved. And then for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. So they say, look, the universalists who believe everyone's going to receive eternal life say, look, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Therefore, everyone's going to be saved. That's not what this verse is teaching. This verse is teaching salvation is for everyone, both the Jew and Gentile. But this verse is not teaching that everyone is going to be saved. Look what it says. The grace of God that brings salvation. So the opportunity to be saved by the grace of God has appeared to all men. Now, does that mean that everyone's going to be saved? No. As read, look at this. You know why you preach the gospel to every creature? Because the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. All men can be saved. So therefore you preach the gospel to every creature because all men can be saved. But does that mean that everyone is going to be saved? He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Not everyone is going to be saved. We read in Philippians chapter 2, verse 10 and 11, where it says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. And so individuals say, look, every knee is going to bow at the name of Jesus. Every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. This verse is not teaching that every individual is going to be saved. This verse is explaining the authority, the position which Jesus Christ has right now over the living and the dead. When it says that the things in heaven, that's reference to all creatures which God created in heaven are commanded to honor Jesus. The things in earth reference to all living things, specifically humans are commanded to honor Jesus. They are under his authority. And likewise, things under the earth. This is reference to dead individuals. Jesus has authority in heaven. He has authority over the living. And he has authority over the dead. And so what's going to bring God the Father glory? Well, for those who are living to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. This verse is not teaching that Jesus is going to save everyone. This verse is explaining the position which Jesus has that all men should honor him. 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So here God has stated in 2 Peter chapter 3 that the heavens and the earth, which we currently see, you know, uh, the earth and the heavens, where the, the birds fly and also where the stars are, 
The heavens and the earth are one day going to be destroyed. Why has it not happened yet? Is God slack in his promise? No. It says God is not slack in his promise. The reason why it hasn't happened yet is because he doesn't want any to perish. He wants everyone to come to repentance. You know, if God destroyed the world today, there might be a person tomorrow who would have obeyed the gospel. And so God wants the entire world to be saved. So he has not destroyed heaven and earth because there would be all unsaved individuals perishing. And so if none perish, so they say that no one's going to perish. Universalists say no one's going to perish. Everyone's going to receive eternal life. So in this passage in 2 Peter 3, 9, it says the heavens and the earth are reserved for the day of judgment of ungodly men. If none perish, it can't be called the day of judgment against ungodly men because there would then be no such day. If everyone is going to be saved and everyone is going to receive eternal life, then there is no day of judgment against ungodly men because who then would it be judged and condemned? According to them, no one. This idea of universalism that everyone is going to be saved is simply not true. And that's why when you hear the gospel message, you need to react upon it. You need to believe the gospel that Jesus died for your sins and you need to repent, turn away from those things you're doing wrong. And you need to believe in Jesus and obey him when he says whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. And so 1 Corinthians 15, 22, this is... This is one of the worst, I think, and I saved it for last because it's a good conclusion verse for this video. As in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. This is talking about bodily death. Because of Adam, everyone dies physically. The universalists teach that this has to do with spiritual death and spiritual life saying, oh, well, and they believe in original sin, which means that all men are condemned because of something Adam did, which just isn't true. If you're, if you're a father goes to jail for robbing a store you as his son who were not part of that or his daughter are not going to go to jail with him because your father did something that's not how justice works your father did something you weren't involved you're not going to be blamed for it so this idea of original sin i can do that topic in another video where the original sin teaches that you're condemned because of something adam did that's not the case you're condemned because of what you have done and so this verse is not talking about spiritual death, spiritual condemnation. This verse is talking about bodily death. Adam introduced the bodily death into the world. When God told him not to sin and Adam sinned, God kicked them out of the Garden of Eden. What was in the Garden of Eden? The tree of life. If they would have ate from that tree, they would have lived forever. But because they sinned, they were kicked out. And you know what? Because Adam and Eve were kicked out and reproduced outside of the Garden of Eden, we have no access to that tree of life to live forever. So because of Adam... Everyone dies. But look at this. Because of Jesus, everyone is going to be made alive. Everyone is going to be resurrected. There's one resurrection. We already read that. Look at that. I would take a note here in your Bible next to 1 Corinthians 15, 22. Because of Adam, everyone dies. So because of Jesus, everyone is going to be resurrected. All that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. Jesus is through whom the resurrection comes. And it says there's two groups of people. Those that have done good, they're going to receive the resurrection of life. Those that have done evil to the resurrection of damnation. These are the verses which we covered. Um, the overview, simply put, is everyone going to receive eternal life? No. But you don't have to be among that group. You can choose to believe the gospel and obey it. These are a lot of verses which we just reviewed that are taken out of context to teach universalism. None of these verses which they use teach that everyone is going to be saved. They're taken out of context. You need to look at the verses before it, the verses after it, compare it with other scriptures. And especially you need to take note that just because these verses say one thing, you have to harmonize them with these verses. These verses say that not everyone's going to be saved. So you can't look at these verses and say everyone's going to be saved. That's not how good Bible study, good Bible interpretation works. That's a contradiction. And these verses do not contradict each other. What it is is universalism is a false teaching. Those who promote universalism are false teachers. Um, they're promoting false teachings. They're teaching falsely because the Bible does not say that everyone is going to be saved. Jesus said, if you want to be saved, you need to believe and you need to be, need to be baptized. Jesus' blood washes away our sins. 
Acts 22, 16 says, Why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. When you believe in Jesus as the Savior who died for your sins and resurrected so you can be forgiven, and you want to experience that forgiveness, at the point of baptism, God has promised to wash away our sins and save us. 1 Peter 3, 21, baptism saves us through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you want to be saved through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you need to be baptized with him where you're buried with him and also risen with him. Ephesians chapter 2 says that when you're risen with him, when you're made alive together with him spiritually, you are saved by grace. And Colossians chapter 2, 12, uh, 12 and 13 tell us the moment which we're made alive together with Christ, and that's when you're buried with him in baptism and you're risen with him, having been made alive with him. And it says literally in that verse, having forgiven you all your trespasses, meaning at the point of baptism, what do you receive? The forgiveness of your sins through the blood of Jesus. And so if you want to be saved, I would encourage you, um, listen to these teachings, believe them, trust them and obey them. Jesus said, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. If you do not, the Bible does not give you the promise or the hope of eternal life. And so that's my hope for you is that you choose to obey the gospel. You choose to study your Bible and you choose to apply it and share these truths with others. Have a nice rest of your day.